distribution uh, via banking channels. It's available as a free add-on to existing online banking, and it's creating a completely new opportunities and new quality in the SME space. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Cash Director is available as additional tab in existing online banking. If you click it, you will get the same look and feel application as the online banking, serving four most, uh, let's say, frequently used features the small businesses use, like to issue invoices, uh, collect money, uh, register costs, and pay your bills. Additionally, we provide small businesses with a tool to balance the cash flow and plan it and, and have a good visibility over the next four weeks. On this screen, you can see that in four weeks, three are green, which is okay, and the one is red. Uh, we are short 4,000 and we need to take action. Let's go into details. And on the right side, we see our obligations we need to pay. At the same time, on the left side, we see our invoices. We are waiting to be paid. The balance is negative, it's minus four, we are short, so we need to find a solution what to do. We can ask our bank to give us a short-term loan uh, to finance the shortage in the working capital, or we can go for factoring, which is also quite getting more and more popular. Uh, let's try it out. It's easy, it's enough to choose the period for financing, accept the cost, and it's done. And depending on the ticket size, you may have money on your bank account in five minutes when the ticket is small or in two days when the ticket is larger. Cash Director is very easy and friendly to use. As an example, I may show you how to issue the sales invoice in less than 10 seconds. Uh, let's use the quick invoice fun function, fill in the product and service description, price, accept, and that's it. Invoice will be sent electronically to, to, to the receiver. In the same time, system is detecting potential shortages like we saw previously on this uh, cash flow plan. The system uh, is able to see that you have minus four uh, in balance and it's uh, immediately advising you to take uh, an invoice discounting function so we can have the money from the invoices we just issued in the next five minutes. Uh, cash director is a win-win for both banks and small business clients. Uh, helps small businesses to better manage their cash flow and have more easy access to financing. At the same time, it's helping this delivering benefits for banks, like increasing profitability of small business portfolio, is increasing new business acquisition, and it's increasing loyalty of existing clients, is increasing uh, stickiness of your banking offer. Our traction currently is 60,000 users. Uh, one minute more for the Q&A. We have uh, international rewards, and we delivered some real business results to our current clients, like 25% more new business acquisition thanks to our tool, and 90% more transactions on the bank account, which is also increasing revenue uh, on SME, small and medium clients. Uh, and you can have Cash Director with basic features and first business benefits available for your clients in just three months. Thank you for your attention. Go ahead, question. Uh, is the solution uh, implemented by the bank? And if, if it's implemented by the bank, how does the bank get the payments and receive the data of the client? Mm -hmm. um, solution uh, is, um, is, is a cloud-based solution, and we are partnering with banks, exchanging data via private APIs. So usually we are collecting consents from clients both to receive data from the bank side and also to send our accounting data to the, to the bank side. Matt and Ken, you had a question? Yeah, go ahead, use the mic, Ken. You're, you're referring to a factoring uh, in this process. Is the bank intended to be the buyer of the receivable or is it a third party? Uh, the bank, is deciding on this process. So because we are signing an agreement with a bank and the bank, it is the bank's decision, uh, will the bank be interested to, to buy the, the, the invoice? Or 
provide the factoring uh, services or will invite third party providers from outside. Sometimes the mixed solution is also quite efficient. And does that, does your, your process include an underwriting component to it or is it assumed that the receivables are credit worthy? Uh, we are doing the pre-qualification pre process. So we, we use uh, external uh, APIs to check the, uh, the limit, factoring limit availability, plus we, uh, we, we uh, do the pre-qualification pre based on uh, rules uh, agreed with, with the factoring service providers. So, but then the underwriting is, is made on the uh, provider side. When you talk about small business, what size of business are you targeting? We are targeting small companies starting from sole traders, so one-man companies, up to 10 employees, because we believe these companies cannot afford to hire a human uh, CFOs, and our digital CFOs may be very helpful for them. Thank okay. you to Patch Director and Rafal, all the way from Warsaw, Poland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is Varys Rajesh, and I think following uh, Rajesh is Pencil yeah. Data and Val. Yeah, uh, and I'll request Val and Pencil Data also to be ready because you're next after that. All right. So I'm not Adam Lake. I'm Rajesh Patil. So Adam couldn't make it last minute, so I thought I'll pitch it for him. It's an awesome product. So we'll go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. All right, before, before I go to this, uh, I think, you know, before we go into the product, uh, do, let's talk about Digital Bazaar. Digital Bazaar has been in business for 15 years, and they have been working heavily last 10 years in building web standards, and they are a blockchain company. Uh, some of the web standards that you see there that developed by them, including the JSON-LD, and then they have customers in retail, education, healthcare, and government, and they are looking into customers in fintech or financial services now. And the interesting thing is they are in contract with the United States Department of uh, Homeland Security and they are doing building a blockchain solution for Homeland Security. So that's that kind of intriguing and interesting. Go to the next slide. Sorry. Okay, okay. So when we talk about blockchain and banking, there was a lot of discussion today on it. So there are some of the key use cases that come to mind. Identity management being one of the largest clearing and settlement, payments, we talked a lot about it, trade finance, we talked about that. So basically what we'll focus on for Veris is identity management. Veris has built an identity management ecosystem. The reason we call it as ecosystem because it's not only give you a one point solution, but helps the consumers to manage their identity, their credentials, for different businesses, including your healthcare identity or the DMV license, or it can be a bank account. So these are the four key components of uh, Veris ecosystem. If you see at the wallet, a consumer has a web-based wallet, which is a cri cryptographically encrypted and a secure wallet where all your, uh, your healthcare card, your bank accounts, your driver license, everything is managed onto this wallet. And once that is, that's basically with the consumer, and there is an issuer. Issuer is a bank who is issuing an account, or there can be a DMV who is issuing your driver license, or there can be a healthcare provider who is issuing your healthcare. So all, all of those are the issuers who are basically issuing those cards. And the third is basically the verifying, the system that verifies the credibility of those uh, identification. And the ledger is where the blockchain ledger, where all the information is stored, tracked, and security based identification is done on a blockchain system. So the, imagine having a consumer control their credentials. It's, it's very interesting where a consumer owns their credentials, doesn't matter where they are using those credentials, whether they are using it for as a driver license, whether they are using it in a hospital for medical, they are controlling it. Now this removes the big headache from the organizations to basically manage a consumer credentials. So they don't have to manage, even the issuer may not be available during times where I could basically validate my credentials using the verifier and get the services. So it's a very interesting where consumer, you as a consumer controlling your credentials from different, from different organizations into your own wallet, which is a web-based wallet. In the next slide, you'll see that this is how it basically works. You have your card holder, 
it, it's on your phone, but it's a web-based uh, application, a web-based wallet, where you have all your credentials, and there's the issuer, the verifier, and the blockchain where everything is tracked on. So the power is given to the consumers and not the organizations who issued the credentials, and that's, that's the power of Veris. I'll go to the next slide. These are some of the difference between the current organizational centric based uh, verification and the customer centric based verification. If you look at that, this system, the legacy system is slow because your different credentials are stored in different places. Now you are using your driver license where the verification is done by a different system. You're using your uh, different identification of the KYC, which is verified by a different system. So that's slow and basically the information is scattered and there's a risk of security risk. But in the new system, which is a customer centric, you look at the consumer is owning all the credentials. They can decide when to release it, whom to release it, and how to release it. So they're basically using the wallet to authenticate themselves onto different organizations. And it's faster, and it's secure, and it standardizes the whole process across KYC or other systems. Again, these are some of the use case that we thought about is uh, the business credentials. So how you verify the business, you can use Veris as a platform for business credentials, or the consumer credentials that we already talked about. The digital accounts, as fintechs and banks are evolving to become more of a uh, you know, digital system, now they might start issuing a digital account. Instead of a credit card, a digital credit card, a digital deposit account would be issued for that, and those all would be saved into your wallet, uh, including the accounts and the loans and then your digital identity would be saved on this wallet, which is a centralized one blockchain. Yeah, Ajish, we need to move into Q&A now. Okay, awesome. Uh, I'll just one last thing, uh, and I think you know the, the wallet is basically, there is no cryptocurrency issued by the, uh, by the company, but it's, it's a blockchain platform. Questions? All right, questions. I may not be able to answer all the questions, but I'll try my best. You know, so one, uh, I'm just curious, you mentioned uh, multiple times that this is a web-based solution. Yes. Yes. So you didn't say it's a mobile solution. So I was a little confused on that. Can you clarify? So it, it's, that? it's accessible on mobile. It's a responsive web, but it's a wallet where you can access anywhere. Does not have to, you don't have to install an app, per se, a native app on your phone, okay. but you can use it on a web. Okay, store. so my second question is that when you talk about the blockchain, is that the blockchain ID generated on the phone itself? So you're using no. the power of the phone or you're using some cloud-based solution? So there, there's a private key and uh, information stored on your on, on your account, on the web-based account, which is the various account that you have, okay. which is a web-based wallet. And from there, it's been, issue, it's been verified with the verifiers and then uh, and a track on the blockchain. Uh, you didn't talk about an actual use case. Like, you know, you talked about a use case, but like a real example of any client or any customer using this. So the biggest is the, the Department of Homeland Security. So they are using it, building a blockchain-based platform and exclusively with Digital Bazaar uh, as a technology providers to the, for the border security. So they are looking at as identification management for the border secur security, and that's one of the largest use case. But it's been widely used, and these are the two URLs you will get some of the use case. But it's used in healthcare. It's currently used in healthcare, education, and retail, uh, and financial services for the digital accounts. Thanks, Rajesh. Thank you. Val, you're up next. So while Val is starting, is Karthik and Brian Mao in the room? Can you raise your hand? Okay, both are here. Okay, okay Thank great. You. And uh, Sojo, you are next after Val, so go for it. Thank you. I'm Val Bergovici. While the slides get loaded up, I'm the founder and CEO of Pencil Data. And uh, I'll read some of the slides for you before they appear. We are aiming to accelerate what has recently been identified as a $7 billion market, blockchain as a service market. And that's due to happen by the year 2023, roughly five years from now. Kumar and I are kind of impatient, so uh, we're going to accelerate that and, and lead the market in the process. Our value proposition is an unheard of one today, which is the ability to take any existing application or workflow and add the decentralized blockchain trust to it in production in five minutes or less. Still not seeing any slides. <laughs> if I remember my first slide, actually, since I still think I'm tight on time, my first slide will be talking to you about the fact that we recognize, as I mentioned earlier in the panel, for those that saw me, that, is it. Okay. that we're a um, second generation blockchain solution. And that means that we are not treating the blockchain as a system of record. We're not replacing databases or storage systems with our blockchain we're effectively treating it as a log, where we verify transactions on existing databases. 
we verify changes to a spreadsheet. So Val, we had some issues with the slide, so your time starts now. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, by the way, since I noticed the issues are related to fonts and these are not the correct fonts, uh, think Pablo Picasso in terms of interpretation of the fonts as you're seeing some of the slides because it's not what was meant to be seen here. So here's what I was saying earlier on. We're treating blockchain more of a, a decentralized trust, the consensus trust value proposition as opposed to a cryptocurrency or money value proposition. And we found this is transformational. Roughly 80% of the use cases in enterprise are not cryptocurrency related, they're trust oriented and the power of decentralized trust, as I mentioned, is transformational. Our approach to the market is very much like Coinbase. Ironically, Coinbase as well is not a cryptocurrency company. They're a company that made cryptocurrency safe, made them very, very simple, and made the process of getting them to them very, very scalable. There hasn't been an equivalent enterprise solution that offers the same value proposition of taking a conventional cloud-based front end, making enterprise use cases for blockchain very simple, that's our major differentiator, making them safe, of course, and making that a scalable process so that every transaction in an enterprise can theoretically be verified by the distributed consensus trust of blockchain. This is one of those Picasso slides, unfortunately, because of the font situation. The, the real challenge, the problem we're targeting in enterprise is that single point of failure, the centralized authority of an administrator, a database administrator, a network administrator, or just a sysadmin in general, can be bribed or compromised. And when you look at headlines such as Wells Fargo and the you know, fraud and, and tampering with customer records there, it wasn't salespeople that became hackers overnight. It was salespeople that sold an administrator and bribed an administrator to tamper with records because any bank you can imagine has very, very tight security controls and audit processes in place, and yet this still happens. So the enemy is centralized control and a decentralized control, a decentralized authority that blockchain can bring can really transform this process. Looking ahead, we see uh, artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning and deep learning making automatic decisions on insurance claims, on loan processing, on a car, whether it turns left, right, or actually respects a stop sign. And the ability to explain those algorithms is only defined by the data that trains those algorithms. So for us to be able to say with certainty this was the data or this was not the data that trained this algorithm is essential in regulated environments where AI is involved. Now those are some business use cases. What we're seeing is infrastructure level use cases as well for this technology. There's an extremely popular movement in the security industry today known as zero trust. And with zero trust, you re-verify because you don't trust identities on a network. You re-verify access points and the validity of them because you don't trust those on your network. You continuously verify network traffic, particularly internal network traffic, because you presume you've been compromised and you don't trust your network traffic. No one yet extends that concept to the data itself. We always assume all the data we're looking at and processing is true and up-to-date all the time, and that's provably false. So we have this architecture which lets you continuously verify data, assuming it's not valid, and we call that zero trust extended. We're already working with Palo Alto Networks and VMware on integration points there, and core banking providers at the higher API level as well. The solution is very, very simple. We have these layers at the top, the simplicity layer, where we've reduced the effort of enterprise blockchain integration. One minute, Bert Cooney. Down from a very complex API surface to a very, very simple three verb interface, register, verify, and log. No data uh, actually leaves the firewall. We only use checksums or hashes of the data. And at the bottom there, you see you can choose one or more blockchains. You're not tied to a proprietary blockchain and you can change your mind over time. Getting started is super simple. You get on our site, you get an account, get the code, and if you're an experienced blockchain developer, you can be up and running in five minutes or less. We can handhold you if you're not as experienced, and that's usually a matter of two hours at most. And if I can advance the slides. Our business model is twofold, subscription-based, uh, annual subscription at the platform level, branded as chain kit, and turnkey solutions such as on the Salesforce App Exchange at the monthly level. The traction is actually across all lines of business, both in business growth with loyalty programs and new entitlements people are selling, also operational efficiencies in the form of being able to track 
and verify and assert compliance with all forms of data and processes, traditional compliance with, with, with FAA, and uh, classic security in the cloud. We have a very experienced team with multiple exits on board. And the funding right now actually has oversubscription at the strategic company level. As I mentioned, companies like Samsung and JetBlue are investing, and we're looking for a lead VC to catalyze our seed round. Thank you, and thankfully the slides rendered okay without <laughs> the normal font. Questions? Can you maybe provide an example of how, how you would use this in a community FI such as ours? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things we see is community FIs you know, still have compliance requirements. And so the ability to lower the cost of internal audits on a much higher frequency on a regular basis and increase the confidence of data accuracy and data you know, veracity during ex surprise external audits you know, is, is one benefit. Loan and mortgage processing is actually a segment we're seeing in the financial services sector right now where we can dramatically lower the costs of compliance with traditional mortgage and loan processing, as well as with machine learning driven mortgage and loan processing where we can help explain the behavior of algorithms. And that fundamentally, as you were saying earlier on, I think in your fireside chat, lets you reinvest a lot of those savings in more customer facing digital transformation initiatives. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all. You're welcome. Sergio, you're up next. And is Karthik around? Okay, you're next after Sergio. So Sergio comes to us from all the way from South Africa. Yeah, hello everyone. I sound a bit weird because I'm not from here. So um, I think uh, I am from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm gonna tell you about Future Bank. Um, just wait for some of the slides to come up. All right, so um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Future Bank. We provide off-the-shelf digital and API banking solutions for any bank. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working, but... Um, oh, this, this guy. Oh, there we go, okay. So um, our product reduces uh, the uh, time to market and cost for digital and API banking uh, for, for any bank by up to 85%. And we do this while still enabling higher quality through tried and tested processes and, um, and our technology. Um, the Future Bank vision is really to be an open banking platform that helps banks meet the demands of the market and regulators in a secure and customizable way. And how we do this is through a library of core banking adapters that we've built that talks to the most popular core banking platforms in the world. Um, and uh, above this, we expose modern REST APIs and uh, customizable digital journeys that can enable banks to more easily integrate with individuals, merchants, and third parties. So if we, if we dig a little bit deeper into this, what our product actually offers is customizable user journeys that banks can easily deploy into production that can talk directly into core banking environments through our adapters and library of core banking uh, integrations. And in order to do this, we have to do this obviously securely. So our product is um, uh, embedded with an OEM um, HSM product that allows us to secure each transaction through the platform. So every digital transaction that goes through our platform is, is uh, secured with certificate pending with HSM tokens that are provided and allow us to talk to um, multiple core banking systems and aggregate a single account view for a customer and also offer core banking functionality. And if this is in place, we can then enable open banking um, solutions for banks to expose core banking functionality to third parties via APIs. So our product really lives in the middle, helping banks leverage off the disruption that exists in the market. Um, if we look at it from a pure product perspective, what uh, a bank is actually buying, they're buying a secure and customizable iOS, Android web channel for the digital banking side, which is componentized. The banks can actually stitch digital journeys together really quickly, thereby reducing the, uh, increasing their agility to, to, and time to market. Um, below that is a, an, an API um, of a library of core banking adapters that can talk to most of the popular core banking systems in the world. We've got a long 
list of adapters that we're, we're, we're um, building libraries for, and we're working from the most popular um, and down. And um, uh, bundled into our API platform is, a, is our, as I was mentioning, our HSM, which allows us to secure each transaction through the platform. And we, we use the HSM to actually cryptographically um, certificate pin digital channels with our API so that we can then leverage that uh, capability to provide all sorts of other value-added features like out-of-the-box biometric um, payment tokenization services and the like. Um, and finally, uh, we have an open banking uh, API marketplace that allows a bank, when they deploy future bank into their ecosystem, to expose those uh, um, core banking features to third parties and fintech partners that they want to integrate uh, into their um, digital journeys for their customers to add additional value to their customers. Um, here's an example of how we've done this for a bank. Uh, um, and this particular bank is in South Africa. For Q &A. Um, we created uh, an integration between an immersive gaming experience, uh, kids banking application written in Unity that talks through our, um, uh, our platform into a FIS profile core banking system. We were able to do the integration within a month end to end and uh, it personified things like gamification, PFM, financial education for kids where the parents could create missions for their kids, um, like do your homework every day for the week and get $10, uh, you know, clean your room uh, every day for the week and get $20, and the kids would uh, accept these missions in the app, um, they would complete them the on, on successful completion, the parents would be able to do an inter-account transfer via our API uh, and, and, and send money to the kids. The kids could then spend the money on data, airtime, or save, set goals for themselves. So this is an example of a bank using our platform to uh, connect core banking functionality, provide innovative user journeys for a, a customer segment that they wanted to, to target. This is just an example of some of the things we've done. There's, here are more examples where we built single uh, views uh, on customer data for um, uh, Barclays, um, a, a challenger bank in South Africa called Vidvest Bank who's in the logistics space uh, where we uh, provided a full end-to-end -end, um, digital uh, omni-channel on top of their core banking environment. Um, and Old Mutual, a mutual company that, that uh, we provided digital banking integration into their cores and solutions um, and integrations into third parties to do things like cash deposits at retailers and point of sale. So it's really connecting core banking functionality in a secure we way to, to third parties. And um, yeah, look, that's our, that's our product. It's uh, 18, Any months, questions? Yeah, 18 months in development and uh, we're six months in production with bank customers. Any questions? I've already asked you a lot of questions. <laughs> you have. But I had uh, one, uh, like, you know, couple of questions. So I think it's a great solution, you know, sitting on top of core, you know, for the basic yes. banking capabilities. Okay. You know, but today uh, we run into a lot of challenges with performance with the core systems, MIPS utilization, yeah. uh, inability to get the real-time analytics. How do you solve for those kind of things with this platform? Well, our, our API is, um, it decouples the, the core to the extent that we are able to uh, cache things closer to the user journey, um, to provide the illusion of speed for customers as opposed to tying the user into the actual underlying architecture uh, as part of their user experience. And uh, in the case of, say, a payment where 99% of the time the payment's going to go through, 1% of the time it's going to fail, if your user experience is tied to that underlying technology end-to-end, um, -end, uh, then you're going to be degrading the user experience. So there's ways which you can uh, cache closer to the client, reduce, uh, uh, create the illusion of speed, and only really affect the 1% of users that you know, really need to be affected if there is a, is a performance degradation of sorts. I don't know if that answers your question. That's an, a, a strategy. Any other questions? Do you have an analytics engine built in, and, and how do you think about being able to take action off of user data and, and some of that? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so at the moment it's pretty rudimentary. Uh, we are tracking things like behavioral information of when, uh, you know, because we're we kind of uh, playing in that digital space, we can uh, understand when users are logging in, when they're connecting, what are they doing. Uh, we, we have to conform to, uh, you know, GDPR and not, uh, not uh, look too deeply into that data, but we can anonymize a user, uh, a, a generic user's uh, behavior with, with, a, with a banking institution and understand that data. Um, right now, it's quite a rudimentary set of analysis that we're uh, that we're doing on on the data. But um, our strategy is really to partner with best-of-breed providers 
One of the providers that we're looking at uh, integrating into our platform is Data Robot. And what they do is they uh, infer uh, data science algorithms on the fly based on the data that's coming in. So depending on which banking institution we'll be working with, uh, we'd rather provide them with a, a data science service in the platform that looks at the data we're collecting rather than making those inferences ourselves. So that's kind of the, the strategy we have there. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, Thank you. Yes, thanks. question. So in Milo, we, can we take it offline? Yeah, if sure. We're running behind. Thank you, Sergio. No problem. Thank and you. And Future Bank. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, next up is Karthik from Moxtra. You heard um, Car uh, Moxtra's founder earlier today. Now we'll hear their short pitch. Great, thanks everyone. I know it's getting a little bit late in the day, so really appreciate your attention here. Um, so some of you may have caught the talk earlier about Moxtra, and I'll just kind of go through and re-elaborate on who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Uh, and fundamentally, what we provide is private collaboration channels to really fast-track financial transactions. Sorry, I have to figure out this clicker. And we do that by providing a next generation, secure, embeddable, uh, secure message center solution. So a little bit on who we are. Our, our background as a company actually comes from WebEx. So we were founded by Sue Breyer, who spoke earlier today. Uh, and he was the original co-founder and CEO of WebEx. And that was really transforming the way businesses and people collaborate in the internet and web era. And around 2012, he, along with you know, some of those principal architects at WebEx, uh, saw a big opportunity in the mobile collaboration space. And that was kind of the original vision with which uh, Mockstar was created. So many of you may have seen this video uh, of our implementation with Citibank. Uh, it's about a two minute video, and we can go ahead and play that right now. I think it's you know, probably the best indication of what our solution is and the, the key value propositions. So I don't know if you can pull it up over there. I can see them working on it back there, but you know what? It's five minutes, so we'll just go ahead and continue. Uh, we were not um, prepared for this, but keep going, Karthik. OK, Try sounds good. That, that's fine. Uh, I have the video playing on my laptop outside, so if you're interested, feel free to stop me there. Uh, these are a list of some of our customers. Uh, so we started uh, over in the APAC region with Citibank. Uh, by really digitizing the ability for the relationship managers at City Gold uh, to communicate and accelerate their transactions with their clients. Uh, since then, we've expanded into several different regions. So we have a big presence in Singapore through OCBC, Standard Chartered, and so on. Uh, Europe with uh, Raiffeisen Bank, AB, and AMRO. Uh, and in the US, we recently announced a big partnership with FIS. So if you're an FIS customer, whether it's mobile banking or online banking, uh, Moxtra will come integrated into those solutions uh, to accelerate that customer engagement. So I want to talk a little bit about why we do what we do, and it's really built around this mobile work style. And if you were there for Subra's talk, you know, one of the big innovations that WebEx did was collapse space, because people could meet from any you know, place in the world at the same time. In the mobile era, it takes it a step further, and it's really about multiplexing space and time. You have so many different threads with you know, several different people. So it's almost like you're having 10 different conversations that are going on at the same time. And if you look at you know, kind of the low touch services, uh, these have already been disrupted by this mobile paradigm. You're able to transfer money on the go. Uh, you're able to order a car, order groceries, and so on. But when we talk about high value services, uh, things that banks provide, uh, there's still plenty of room for disruption over here. And this is what we focus on at Moxtra. So it's really these high value services, things that require compliance, security, uh, complexity, time, as well as people involved. Uh, that's where the need where you provide you know, a collaboration channel for them to resolve these transactions, uh, you can unlock a lot of business value there. So if you kind of map that chart over to the financial services spectrum, uh, you see that there's you know, several different opportunities here. At the lower segment, you kind of have the, the mass market and retail banking, uh, where you can integrate a platform like Moxtra with, let's say, a bot or a robo-advisor and automate a lot of these transactions.
But as you kind of step up the val value pyramid, you'll see that there's really a need for this collaboration. So this is the interaction between wealth advisors and customers, uh, or the interaction between, let's say, business relationship managers uh, and the businesses that, you know, that, that bank with you. Uh, and this goes all the way up to trade finance, where you can resolve discrepancies in letters of credit and so on. So giving them a collaboration channel to quickly resolve these types of transactions uh, can make these, make these transactions go faster. And if you look, a lot of this is already happening today, uh, if especially at the international market. You know, people are already, you know, collaborating with their relationship advisors using unsecured channels like WhatsApp, WeChat, and so on. Uh, but the problem is, you know, it's a huge compliance challenge for these banks. So what we provide basically is a private channel to do these transactions. And the traditional approach that banks have had is, you know, by providing some sort of phone number inside of their mobile app or, you know, an email inbox. But the next generation of that is what Moxer provides. It's this secure, private, embeddable channel which banks can customize, make it their own solution, and really embed it inside of their customer-facing applications to facilitate these transactions. And it's backed by a fully secure, auditable, and compliant backend which can be deployed on-premise, on a private cloud, or, or managed by Moxra. And you'll see that it includes all the different capabilities that lead up to the transaction. So everything from secure messaging, uh, to sharing documents, collaborating on top of these documents with e-signatures and so on, uh, up to actually closing the transactions. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Uh, happy to dive a little bit deeper if you're interested and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So, you know, um, one question I have, how is this different from you know, like, you know, for example, Bank of America is rolling out Erica. Yeah. I'm just curious, you know, I mean, could they not do with Erica what you're proposing here, or is this a step above there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So Erica, for those of you who don't know, that's like a conversational AI platform that Bank of America recently announced. And I think solutions like that are really good for the mass market and retail customers. Uh, so a lot of those low-touch services, you know, like simple questions like, hey, I forgot my password or something like that, uh, we see a lot of those being automated. But especially when you go into more high-value transactions, things like wealth management, things like business banking or even, you know, commercial banking, uh, you know, that human touch is required, whether it's, you know, for the trust factor or just for the complexity. Uh, and I think we play, you know, much better in that space uh, as opposed to this very low touch space where we still integrate with bots, you know, such as Erica, uh, but the human touch is, you know, required for the collaboration. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Great. Karthik. Thank you. Uh, Brian? So Brian is from Saytech. Do we have Doug here? Doug actually, I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, that's oh, okay. Actually, I'm Steve Hoffman from Saypay. Brian had to uh, step out, uh, but I'm really happy to be here and be part of, uh, uh, of this great event. Uh, thank you for having us. What I'd like to talk to you about is Saytech, and what we offer is a voice biometric solution that combines both security and convenience together. My co-founder Brian and I started Saytech three years ago. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the financial services industry at Visa, MasterCard, and a variety of different banks and processors. Here's the problem. Every week you open up the paper and you see data breaches, okay, Equifax, JP Morgan Chase, Anthem, Target, Home Depot, the list goes on and on. All of that account information is being stolen, put on the dark web. Combine that with the insecurity of passwords and the fact that people don't, don't create secure passwords and they reuse them across websites. They write them down or store them insecurely on their, on their uh, computers. The result is that this year, two out of five accounts will be compromised as a result of, of the data breaches and the poor password construction. Why do we like voice biometrics? 
Boy Biometrics does one thing that none of the other biometric solutions do. Your fingerprint, your iris scan, your facial scan, those are all static, but your voice is dynamic. You can actually say something that has meaning and you can change what you say each time. What we do is we have launched what we call Voice Biometrics 2.0. What's 2.0? 2.0 is taking voice recognition to the next level by digitizing it, by using digits. Digits allow for a passcode to be dynamically created and used just one time. You can use a digit-based voice pin or voice password as a way to bind your voice to a smart contract on the blockchain. You can use digits to identify yourself to a specific invoice or to a contract or to signing, signing any legal document. So what we anticipate is that the ability to be able to use digits brings you far beyond what any other providers can do out there in this space. Uh, the, one of the, the beauties about using the digit-based approach and having a voice print on file is that you can now you reuse that across your enterprise. So you, you get a, a much greater lower to, uh, cost of, of ownership. You can use it for step-up authentication. You can use it in combination with your other biometric uh, or non-biometric types of authentication solutions. Um, use it for password resets. One thing that I absolutely detest, and I think everybody can probably relate to this, is putting in your username and password and getting that darn message back that says incorrect password. Now you've got to go back and figure out, wh well, which one did I use? And a lot of times it causes you to have to go and reset your password, get your one-time uh, password SMS to you. It's a terrible user experience. And when there's so much focus on the importance of the user experience, why aren't we looking at the authentication user experience and improving that? I would like to be able to have every app on my phone allow me to just One use minute. to just use thank you, use my voice to sign in as opposed to having to type in something. So why aren't we offering that? It works on every phone. It's very secure. It's very low cost. We offer the service in the web. It's a low cost for managing the voice print, which gets better every time it gets used because we have an AI component. We have more samples. Every time you use it, it continues to get better and more accurate. So you can see you can use it across the enterprise. And the best thing is we've developed something called Voice in a Box. This can plug into your mobile app, and you can have something with the, with the uh, senior developer up and running within only a couple of hours. So it's a great way. We offer a free trial. Um, it's it's web-based. It's super simple. And uh, it gives you a chance to be able to really explore it, uh, do your own proof of concept, or we're, we're happy to help you with that, um, or to uh, help you with the development of getting it integrated into your own mobile app. So I'd like to thank you for, uh, for that, and happy to take any questions. Are you contemplating uh, talking with any of the core providers about about integration for again for those institutions that are smaller and dependent upon cores? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, we love the uh, the platform uh, philosophy where we can work uh, with platforms on having it as an option built in as part of their overall solution set. And what we do in that case is we have a, a rev share. Uh, partnership agreement where if it gets embedded within a platform, um, we share in any revenues that we take in. So it's a, it's a very symbiotic type of relationship. I, I, I think it's a very interesting use case, especially in case of uh, digital authentication, you know, because we run into situation with bad devices and, you know, your account takeover happens, right? But with uh, voice, I think it definitely provides that Proof, right? so it certainly any, are does. Are you doing any work with any of the banks, or we are. We we um, we have several uh, partners and resellers. Uh, we have a bank live in Switzerland. Uh, we have several uh, institutions in the U.S. that are live doing a, a proof of concept now, and we've recently integrated into an IVR uh, solution as well. 
So we really see that this is going to be the next biometric uh, revolution that will happen. Yeah, it looks great technology. Now, so is this something which, like, you know, this is uh, something which is embedded within mobile app or, you know? It is. It's embedded within the mobile app, but it can also... So the go out, like, you know, you have solutions like Transmit where you uh, go out, right? I mean, here you, it's all built within the app, right? It's not going over the cloud. No, it, so we have two options. One is that it is a local within the device itself, which meets the, uh, the FIDO compliant requirement. Uh, but for higher security, we recommend using our cloud-based service uh, because the cloud-based service actually is, uh, we can do a lot more computational analysis and, and, and use more sophisticated algorithms than a phone is able to do. Uh, so uh, we offer both. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we had, um, who's next, Mina? Doug, Classbox. OK. So while Doug is getting set up, we had companies from South Africa, Poland, obviously the peninsula. Um, Steve, <laughs> uh, Baytech is actually, I'm proud to say, from the East Bay, um, right here in Walnut Creek. <laughs> is Christopher here in the room? No. No, OK. So Teresa? Okay, you're next after dark. Ready? Or when you are. Ready for me. Okay, great. My name is Doug Suval, and I'm here from Glassbox Digital. Um, where's the clicker here? Okay, so I just wanted to put this slide up ahead of time. We are working with the biggest companies in the world. We're working with the biggest four banks in the United States. We're working with a number of the big top 10 big biggest banks in the United States as well as the world. Um, what we do is very simple. We actually record automatically capturing every piece of data, every single session that goes through your mobile app or that goes through your website. So we're automatically capturing all the data, we're automatically structuring it all, and we're providing literally instant replay as if you were behind the person watching what they did as they went through your app or went through your mobile website. I'm sorry, or through, or through your website. Um, the idea is by being able to capture everything, structure it, we can bubble up every single error. We can bubble up every single crash immediately. Um, we can immediately give you insight as to why people, for example, dropped out of a funnel. Um, we can give you insight as to whether somebody signed terms and conditions. We can give you insight as to whether your internal applications that you've created on the web um, are being used correctly by your agents. Uh, we can bubble up a session in, in under two seconds. So for example, we work with Bank of America and they capture three billion sessions every single month. Within two seconds, a contact center agent can find an active session of someone who's having a problem, bring it up, talk with them on the phone and get them off the phone much faster. Um, sorry, backward real quick. Uh, we are, we were founded in 2010. We just took our Series D. Uh, we've now hit about 70 people. And really the value proposition is to find why. Why is this happening? Why are people dropping out? Why is things not going, the customer experience not going the way that we intended? And how can we influence that? Um, we fill a critical void in the digital ecosystem. You guys probably know about digital analytics, web analytics tools like Adobe Analytics and Google Analytics, voice of the customer tools. There's also the other side of the house, APM tools, which are kind of understanding the server side, the infrastructure side. What we're doing is, com is allowing you to see exactly what happened when those tools are bubbling up instances. For example, uh, Adobe Analytics may tell you 100,000 people came to your site, 20,000 people dropped, but they won't tell you why. We will give you the actual replay of those sessions to exactly understand why, and also we don't need to reproduce any problems that occurred because we've captured all the data. And again, we're capturing it all without any tagging whatsoever. So the implementation of our product is very quick, it's very light. With a mobile application, we can implement in 10 minutes. Um, the only uh, configurations that are needed are with information security, which is obviously a very important uh, situation. We do deploy both on cloud and on premise. Uh, the on premise deployment seems to be very popular with the banks because, again, we are capturing everything. Um, the idea is digital transformation. When I walk into a bank, 
it costs me $70 to do a transaction. If I do it on the phone, it's seven cents. That's a thousand percent less on what can be billions of transactions every single month. So when you're talking about a billion dollar opportunity, that's really what Glassbox is representing for the clients that, that we have right now. We are moving them from a reactive stage of customer experience to being more proactive and, and then to an autonomous stage where issues are happening, they're being fixed automatically, and you're just getting a report on how much money you just saved your company. <laughs> the idea is insight, okay? If we can get insight on what's going on in our digital channels fast and immediate, turn around and fix those problems, we can increase revenues, we can decrease the cost of digital, and we can mitigate any type of risk and compliance that goes on within the ecosystem. The idea here is if you're not using a tool that can give you real-time insight immediately on every single one of your customers, then, then you're really like a snail. And if you really are interested in digital transformation at a very high speed, at the speed of a cheetah, then you'll be looking at something like Glassbox Digital to really help in your digital transformation efforts. All the use cases and many, many more. If you can imagine we're capturing every single thing going on in your digital, we're immediately structuring all that data. That um, we can answer questions for any one of these types of, of, of areas within your organization. Last but not least, this is the last slide. Because we are a big data solution built on Cassandra with Elasticsearch, we're able to, through Kafka, export any type of data in real time to create or to add into a data lake. So data lakes are being built to become actionable, immediate insight and action generators from things going on within a, an ecosystem. We clean up the digital pipe, service it so that, for example, a big bank um, has a scorecard on their wealthiest individuals. Anytime one of those individuals touches any of their digital properties, it immediately updates their data lake and, and an action is sent out to send a person to contact them or a promotion to give to them. Let's go to Q&A, Doc. We have less than two minutes. How about we end there? Any questions? Well, the judges first. So I'm curious, how do you, you capture all of this data, how do you report out? How, how, do, how does it become actionable for us? Understood, so we actually have an interface that we provide along with the capture, and in that interface you have session replay and a number of tools within that replay to number one, uh, do click map, heat mapping, uh, number two, to build any type of funnel on the fly. So any type of journey you want to analyze, you can click and drag right from the replay or from the action tree, which is all of the actions, the taps, the clicks, the swipes, the inputs, they're all being gathered on the, le on the, on the side. And you can create a funnel on the fly to, to analyze any type of journey. We also have out of the box reports, which are bubbling up every single crash. So we have what we call the mobile box, which will tell you every crash, your network status, all your top journeys, slowest pages, fastest pages, and any other type of configurable widget that you would like to put up there in the way of a report. How do you handle the security of personal data mm -hmm. and the managed reporting of that? Yeah, very good question. Um, security is, is very important to us. We, we're working with the biggest banks in the world, so we've passed all the security audits. Most of them require us to be on premise, so that's a number one way we do it. We also work with some big companies in the cloud, like USAA, and um, basically we have masking for every field. We, we take a whitelist approach at the beginning, and our entire implementation revolves around the correct security, the correct viewing of that data. There are certain people within an organization, for example, in compliance, that can see certain data, so we give them certain access, for example, in the way of a fraud use case to understand different credit cards that may be entered on multiple times. Um, but yeah, security, happy to go offline and talk talk fully in depth about how we deal with that. And then I gather from what you were saying that when it's on, it's on site, uh, so that there's no transmission of data over the web. It, Correct, so, so it's, it's happening within the bank's internal systems, internal web servers, and so on and so forth. We don't see any of the data. Okay. Thanks, Doc, we're out of time, so can you take that offline? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Teresa, you're next.
Is uh, Farouk here? Who? Farouk? Is Bell's too eight? No. We don't have, oh, sorry. So Santa? Teresa, huh? Santa is here? Okay, so you can go after Teresa. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Teresa. Deck. Um, keep going, Teresa, because we skipped real key didn't come. I'll switch over the deck. I love this company, though. It's not mine. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon. My name is Teresa Grobecker, and I'm the CEO and founder of Real Estate Consortia. What Real Estate Consortia is is a patent-pending title token. And what we do is we issue a title token for every piece of real estate in the United States. And right now, as of this morning, we have indexed and minted title tokens for over half of the properties in the United States. And the way that I think of this is in the movie, uh, The Matrix, when you remember the Sentinels and they're boring down onto the spaceship and they're grinding through, that's what our servers are doing right now. So we've minted 64 million tokens, which is over half of the residential real estate in the United States. This product comes from my experience of starting a real estate brokerage in San Francisco from scratch. I did this in 2012, and I recently merged my real estate brokerage into an investment bank. So the distribution for the title token is completely free. Our model is to go from the franchise to the broker, to the agent, and down to the homeowner. There's an old saying in real estate, and the saying is, if you list, you last. If you list, you last. What that means is if you can attach yourself to the inventory in any area, you will always have a buyer for that piece of real estate in this country. So that is our go-to market, and our title token is 100% free for realtors to distribute to their clients. The agents use the title token as a way to keep in touch with their client. The thing about real estate is if I sell you a house right now, I offer you zero value for the next seven years when you're statistically supposed to go and sell that house. The best I can do is send you a magazine with my face on it, and nobody wants that. <laughs> so this is branded information about your property. I become your watchdog. I am looking out for your best interest on your biggest asset that you will ever own. I will tell you if anyone tries to commit fraud against the title of your real estate, I'm gonna tell you when the mortgage rates go in your favor. I'm gonna tell you what your neighbor just refinanced his house for and how much you could potentially save as well. The broker, so with my broker hat on, this is a big issue for me because I should be sending and receiving 30% of my revenues out of my current jurisdiction. What that means is I'm sending it to a realtor in Palm Springs where I don't have an MLS subscription. I'm literally flying blind. I have no idea when that business closes this business is done on a wink and a handshake in residential, and it's even worse in commercial. Escrow helps us by closing the loop on this referral revenue. We've built the system that allows escrow to proactively and embeddedly in their software track when the referrals are due. And oh, by the way, as a broker, I'm ethically responsible for disclosing to my clients who is paid a referral and why and how much. And I can tell you as a broker, no one does this. So we're helping escrow companies upsell to their broker clients. So I mentioned this, how we distribute. It's broker to agent to homeowner. And we're able to track the referrals because all the relationships that happen with your house are tracked on our title token. Here is an example of what the uh, referral fee agreement looks like. Tomorrow I'm meeting with DocuSign. DocuSign heard me speak at the Real Estate Standards Organization. That's an organization that was started by the National Association of Realtors. And I'm going to that convention uh, this weekend to talk to them as well. The reason why this is so important is because companies like Remax are losing billions of dollars in referral revenue, and mm -hmm. they're asking for this specific solution. So we will be embedding directly into DocuSign where all of the referral agreements are tracked and signed. This is an example of how escrow looks up a property. And when that search is complete, we can see all the relationships that are tracked to this title token. This is our timeline. We're minting tokens right now for the United States. And then we pivot to Canada, where we have a signed LOI. And we can track uh, with our AI platform, with their AI platform, who is likely to buy a house. So our biggest partners in this are going to be banks who have inventory to move off their system. They can send it over to agents who are active on our platform. And oh, by the way, realtors are used to 
standard and customary, paying 35% of our referrals, uh, of our commissions as referrals. Um, so that means that banks, strategic partners, uh, companies like Airbnb, when they send a referral into us, they make 35% of that, of that commission. So in the United States, agent commissions are $70 billion, and there's about 20 billion of that that's on the table through our system. Agents are used to paying $9 billion per annum for marketing, and that's before we've ever turned a profit. The biggest recipient of that marketing money is Zillow. Zillow asks for that payment up front. Our title token goes out for free, and then we capitalize on the back end when a deal gets done. I will say as a real estate broker, I'm very popular with my agents because I get paid when they get paid. And that's the secret sauce to our business. We need to go into Q&A. OK, great. Thank you. Questions from judges? Uh, you know, this seems like an amazing, uh, very innovative idea. How will a bank, uh, how can banks use this solution? Sure. Bank, yeah. We're in early talks with um, large distribution partners, so like the companies that are servicing banks, because banks have short sale and foreclosure in uh, revenue, and they can send that inventory to us, and then we can match that with an agent who's highly skilled in that MSA, um, not only in high number of sales, but also very fluent in short sale and foreclosures. Uh, and we, we can drill down our um, best list price to sales price ratios shortest days on the market. So people who are really experts in their industry to move that inventory off the bank's balance sheets as quickly as possible. And so the banks in this situation could earn a 35% referral fee because agents are so happy to receive that, to receive that business. Is there any benefit for customers, the mortgage, uh, like the house homeowners in this process? Yes, yes, absolutely. So the title token, the more information that the homeowner uh, shares with the system, the higher their provenance score goes. Think about LinkedIn in the early days. Uh, when we launch, it's going to be binary, yes or no, this address has been verified and claimed by the owner. Um, now as we progress over the years, people will share more information because they'll want the score of their property to go up. Um, with my MLO hat on, a lot of that information is private. It'll only be shared through the realtor to parties who need to know. But basically, the more information that they share, the more valuable their property is. And going back to that saying, if you list, you last. So we'll be able to control the inventory in the United States through our title token, since we've already you know, minted half the country. Um, so we basically think that the buyers, especially in MSAs where there's not enough inventory, they'll be coming onto our system. OK, thank you, Teresa. Thank you. The only woman in today's pitch. Let's give it up for Teresa one more time. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Senthil Palaniyappan. Uh, I think I'm getting a different slide. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Patty's gone to check. Just give him a second. Patty, we have the wrong slide here. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah. Uh, this is Senthil Palaniyappan. I'm the founder and CEO of Senovate. Uh, we are the uh, uh, information security uh, uh, service provider. Uh, basically, we are the chief, uh, we are performing chief information security officer function for small to mid cap companies, which is uh, probably 100 employees to 2,000 employees. Uh, so we, we are, uh, it's called, we, we, we are powered by AI. So let's see what does it mean. So introduction was innovate. We have office here, here across the street here and the next building. And also, we have offices in India. And uh, the, basically, we started as information um, uh, infrastructure and uh, integration services company. And then we kind of, after that, we, uh, we expanded into security space. Actually, a little briefly about myself. Uh, myself, I, I kind of founded as a third company for me. First company I did as a database services company acquired by Tech Systems. And the second one is a mobile app, which is uh, which credit card should I use to maximize my rewards? That is available in Apple. Um, uh, Apple Tunes or uh, Google Play, and this is the one uh, fully I'm putting into the uh, what do you call uh, in, in the, this is in the information security. Quickly, uh, these are some of the services we do, and uh, 
uh, basically what we how we help the companies is like uh, predominantly the single sign on basically we establish the people's identity and as well as we uh, we wanted to make sure that they can touch what they can touch within applications and he says as any company if you look at small to mid cap companies they have about 50 applications how do you manage all the users passwords and also the location based login or uh, how do you challenge those kind of things. So single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, identity governance and compliance is also some of the, maybe the financial industry here, people, uh, some of the companies, what they, uh, they have certain regulations, they cannot serve uh, some of the customers because without getting certain certifications, we can uh, either give them the access or revoke based on their certification level, we can build a workflow. So how it is possible, we integrate various security products available in the market, and uh, that's a lot of a big brands. So we integrate all those things. That's how we perform a CISO function, um, kind of combining all the products together. So basically, this is a we 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 kind of we manage manage security services space. We uh, manage it through uh, uh, what we call CISO assistant. Basically, you know, we we build a bot uh, which helps the chief information security officer. Uh, basically, uh, the, the idea here is that you know, the, if you guys know the Google Assistant, right? What if if you have uh, security is very complex, so many uh, so many products, and then chief information security officer may not know uh, how to get the information. Something like a bot sitting on their uh, desktop or the mobile phone, and then they have a conversation to find what it is. Basically, they can ask. Uh, any questions, like, hey, what is what are my top 10 threats today? Or how many uh, licensed users I have? Or uh, wh what happened last night? Whatever they can ask, they can, we, we will provide. Do we have a two phases in that. First phase is mostly uh, interaction, providing information and some analytics. The second one is like machine, basically phase two is like uh, enhanced through uh, machine learning. Basically, you know, so many uh, products that we have threat detection system. When human uh, monitor all those uh, all those logs, sometimes uh, they can carry it away with their regular life. Uh, but what we do is we train the bot. The bot will learn uh, every threat and then it will take actions on behalf of the CISO. So basically, in every Every time, one time we teach the bot, next time it will automatically learn, uh, it's self-learning, and then it will do it. So that is, that is, this is our uh, pet project we've been building. And uh, so th this is uh, basically first one, uh, this is called, we call the CISO God. So basically, the value proposition, proposition for, for our company is like we established this company, and then it's a self, it's a, we've been boot, bootstrapping so far, and uh, we, uh, we run uh, with uh, experienced uh, staff, and uh, we, we have a good customer base. One and more minute. We, uh, we are potential to grow big. And actually, the biggest pitch I'm going to have is so it, it's a lot of potential. I'm looking for a co-founder to kind of get this company to the next level. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's me. And having said that, uh, any questions? So very security intensive. Questions from the judges? Matt? So how do you typically engage with a, say, an IT group within a small community bank? So that's a very good question. So typically, you know, it's a top down. Um, so basically, you know, this, uh, it's, I, we have to work closely with IT because this, even though the security, the biggest challenge is that, you know, you need to kind of bring everybody on board because it's going to be touching all the applications. So we, we so our uh, ex <clears throat> experience in uh, the uh, IT versus security, so that helps us to leverage our uh, with, the, with work with IT team. And, and sorry, one follow-up to that. What, what are the economics? Are, are we, in your experience, have you been able to um, reduce costs for, for your clients? What's kind of the value proposition for, the, for your customers? That's a very good question. The value uh, value proposition is, so if we look at the companies, like I talk about small to mid cap companies, so security is very complex. If they wanted to do it themselves, they have to hire tons of people to do that. So basically, you know, what we do is we, we work with the chief information security officer and they take all the functions underneath that and work with the IT to get, get, get it done. So probably we, we can complete this like 25% of the cost of what they would have done by themselves. Any other questions? Thank you, Sentil. That, that concludes our startup pitch event. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you to the judges.
Uh, we'll debrief with the judges and get back to all the startups that pitch. Thank you again for, for staying late um, about the, the next steps and the zero equity accelerator um, kind of run in I Valley. So we'll get back because I don't want to hold people from wine and beer. So, <laughs> so thank you again, Ken, Matt, and Sandeep for judging. And it's late. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This concludes FinTech Talk, although the best part is just coming. So uh, we have wine and beer served right just outside. And that will, um, hall is also available. There's some tables set up. So hang out, network, and, and there's some hors d'oeuvres as well. Thank you, and see you next year. So where, where is kind of...